All right, here's my part two of my ultimate sling care guide or ultimate sling guide. Again, um, I really was wishing, for, hoping for this to be one large video, but it's over an hour and a quarter now, so I'm breaking up into two pieces. The idea was to take somebody that was fairly new to the hobby through the whole process of selecting a sling, buying it, picking the size, unpacking it, and then caring for the sling. But I figured this video was getting so long, nobody would ever wade through it, so we're breaking it into two pieces. The main um, format I'm using follows my tarantula sling husbandry guide that I wrote for my website a while back. And the thought process is that pictures are worth a thousand words. So rather than having to weed through this 15,000 or 10,000 word article, people can see me demonstrate some of the stuff with some pictures of the slings in question and some of the techniques I use. So this section is going to be a little bit different. It's going to start off with feeding and then hydration maintenance, temperatures and humidity, and then molting process. So we're going to try to cover all the meat and potatoes of raising a sling. Okay, so you received your tea, you housed it, there were no issues, you've even waited a couple days like you're supposed to to let it situate, now it's time to feed it. Feeding slings can really freak some people out, and I get it because I've been there, and sometimes I still have some issues feeding my slings. Part of the problem is sometimes you have a sling that's so small, you're not sure where you can find prey items that are that small. Sometimes they don't seem like they're eating. There's a lot of different things that can cause keepers fit. So what we're going to do here is go through some of the things you can look forward to, some of the issues you may have, and how to get around them, and some tips that I found that are useful as far as feeding new slings are concerned. And as we can see, this one here has already got something. So let's go on. It seems like on the surface, it should be a very easy thing to do. You have your hungry spider, you drop in your prey item, and then if all goes well, it eats, your spider puts on size, molts, and everything's fine. Unfortunately, it doesn't always go this way. And part of the problem is, people have a hard time figuring out what to feed them at first. Um, they can be very, very tiny, and it can be difficult for a keeper to find prey items that uh, meet that size requirement. So let's start off on some of the things you can feed them. Here we have crickets. They're available everywhere, very easy to find in pet stores. They come in sizes like pinhead and small crickets that are usually good for small tarantulas. They can be bought in small numbers. The only thing you gotta watch out for is they can eat or harm a molting tea. Next, we have mealworms. Again, you can buy them. Unfortunately, you have to buy them in large numbers, but you can refrigerate them, which means you can use them and keep them for a long, long time. If you don't use them all, they come in different sizes. They're very uh, inexpensive, and later on when we get to killing and cutting up prey, kind of gross, but we'll get to that in a minute, they're very easy to cut up and feed to smaller tarantulas. Next, we have bee lats or red runners. These guys will be a little more tricky to find. You don't find them in pet stores, so you'd probably have to buy them from a dealer or somebody that sells them in large quantity. They do come in a very convenient small size when they're nymphs that are great for tiny, tiny slings, and they're easy to raise. They're just invasive, so be careful if they escape. And here we have bee dubias. Again, these guys are easy to raise. They're not invasive. They're going to be a little more tricky to find, but you can raise your own, especially if your collection gets large. The issue are, is they play dead, and the nymphs can be too large for the smaller slings. So now that you've figured out what you'd like to feed your tarantula, the next question is what size do you feed it? General rule of thumb, don't feed prey items that are any longer than the T's body, and sometimes smaller is better. Remember, these guys are small and can sometimes be intimidated by larger food items. So now that we figured this out, we drop in our item, and unfortunately the tea isn't interested. So what do we do now? There's a couple things that could be going on. First, the prey item could be too big, in which case, try offering something smaller. This happened with my M. Balfouris the first time I raised them. Giving them much smaller prey items seemed to work, and they would take the live items. So if you're thinking the item might be too big, try smaller. And second... Sometimes giving pre-killed or even cutting off pieces of larger prey items if you can't find smaller ones works great. Cricket drumstick, which is just a leg, is great for tiny slings. Cutting crickets up, it's gross, I know, but kill them, cut them up, and leave the prey inside. It's a great way to make sure your sling can eat and you don't have to worry about things like flightless fruit flies, which are absolutely terrible to work with and I kind of swore them off and warned people against using them. When in doubt, Feeding pre-killed prey or larger prey cut up is the way to go. Many slings are used to scavenging in the wild and will eat this way readily. 
So let's just go through how we do this. Here we have our sling enclosure. I'm gonna take the cut up piece of Cricut, gross I know, and I'm gonna drop it not in the burrow, but right in front of the burrow. We don't wanna drop it inside because if the tarantula isn't hungry, we're gonna to have to dig it out later. And there's our tea going, hey, what's going on here? Um, so don't drop it in the burrow. A lot of people make that mistake and then it starts to rot or you have to dig it out. Not a lot of fun. And then what happens is we come back later and a couple things could have happened. And generally I do this overnight first, the item's gone. Great. It means it's probably dragged it down into its burrow. It'll feed on it. No smaller slings may feed on that big one for a long time and be done. And then let's take this one. Sometimes you come in and the item's moved. Very small slings might not make a huge dent in larger prey items. So this is a good way to tell if the slings eaten. And I found that most of them will drag it around somewhere. So if the items move, they have probably fed even if it doesn't look touched. Now, how often should you feed? Once a week is sufficient for a sling. However, many of us will feed more often, two or three times a week. I generally feed mine every three days or so, the smaller slings, because you want to get them out of that delicate sling stage as fast as possible. In the wild, slings are basically built to eat as much as they can when they have it so they can outgrow that stage, um, reduce their fear of predation, and their susceptibility to the elements like bad weather. A lot of people will try to say this is power feeding. It is not. Power feeding is something that came out of the snake hobby where you up the temperature and feed the animal as much as possible to get it to grow quicker. It doesn't really work with tarantulas. And if you want to read more about power feeding, I did do an article on it for people that are interested or worried about power feeding. Uh, keep in mind, though, if you do feed your sling a lot, some of them will get to their pre-molt period faster and spend more time in pre-molt. So just something to think about. But it is not bad for the tea, and we'll just get the tea out of the sling stage faster. And every once in a while, the thing won't eat, in which case you're going to fast forward to the pre-molt section as that's probably what your sling's doing. So to end off, feeding shouldn't be incredibly stressful. Here we have the one I fed earlier, feasting on that big piece of cricket. And you just have to realize that these things have been around for millions of years. If they didn't know how to eat, they wouldn't have lived that long. So when one's not eating or giving you a hard time, try to go through this checklist, try the different things, and you should have a nice, healthy, fat sling that's ready to molt in no time at all. All right, we fed our teas, we got them all set up correctly. Now we need to keep them hydrated. And tarantulas as slings are particularly vulnerable to dehydration. They don't have the waxy coating that their juvenile and adult counterparts have that trap in the moisture. So all slings benefit for some moisture. You always want to give them a choice of where to go, which is why when we set up our enclosure, we did the bottom layers a lot more moist than the top layer. So if we have a species that doesn't like the moist substrate, it can hang up top. But I found that the majority of them will burrow to find that nice moist substrate. But how do we keep it moist? And what do we do to keep our tea watered to make sure that it has water when it needs it? So uh, what we're gonna do now is break down some of the methods you can use and what I use for mine. Hopefully these will help some people out. Because again, when you've got your little teeny tiny sling, the, the biggest concern you're gonna have is making sure that it stays hydrated and doesn't dry up. It happens to the best of us, it's happened to me where I've, through my own negligence, screwed up and didn't give it enough water and ended up with a dead tarantula. This was a while back, but I took it to heart and was still upset about it. And hopefully we can prevent this with other people. So in a moment, we're going to switch camera views here and we're going to go in a little closer to show some of the methods I use to keep my little slings hydrated. All right, the first method we're going to go over is probably the easiest, including a water dish. I include water dishes with almost all my slings. There's a couple exceptions I'll go over in a moment. But as you can see here, just a simple bottle cap from a water bottle works great. I buy the water bottles, use the water to water my tarantulas, and keep the caps for water dishes. I always have a lot on hand. So if this gets all muddied up, I can just pull it out and drop it a new one. And you'll see in the arboreal one here, also have a water dish right in there. And they're very easy to fill, especially for something like this. You can either pour water in or you can use a sprayer to go ahead and spray it in. Same thing with this one here. You take it, spray it in, done. 
Um, people have gotten very, very creative in what they use for water dishes. Uh, I've heard of people using golf tees. They cut them off and they plant them in the ground, pour it in. Legos has become a popular one. The tattoo, tattoo ink pots have become very popular. So there's many, many different things you can use. Uh, the trick is just finding something that works for you and something that's cheap and that you can have on hand because sometimes they'll web all up or fill it with dirt and it's easier to just pluck it out and throw it away. But uh, number one, water dishes, the biggest complaint I hear from people. I mean, there are a lot out there that won't use them. I understand it. It works for them. But for somebody just getting into the hobby and having slings for the first time, I would encourage you to try using them. Uh, I've heard people complain, well, you just have to fill them up again. They evaporate quickly. Yeah, that's great. But um I shower every night, I get dirty again, so that really isn't a good excuse that because it evaporates we have to do it again. No, just keep the water the water dishes in there, keep them full. What I usually do is fill them up every time I feed my slings and do a little maintenance. So if you're feeding your slings once a week or even twice a week, which most people do, then just go in there at that time, make sure the water dish is full and your tarantula won't get dehydrated. Again, spraying's great, and we'll go over that in a moment, but it tends to evaporate quickly. So if you want your tarantula, which at sling stage, they're very prone to dehydration, to be able to get a drink at any time, water dish is the way to go. Now, when we made up our enclosures, one of the things I said you might want to do ahead of time is go ahead and take, I use a paintbrush, you can use a pencil, whatever is something small and thin, and make some furrows down the corners. Now, the first reason we did this is because A, it's a pre-started burrow for our tarantula, so a lot of them will go right down there and make a hole. Second reason is, although we want the top, of, we're not so concerned about the top layer staying moist, when we have slings, we want to make sure there's a place they can go that's nice and moist. And one of the ways to do that is to make sure that the bottom level stays moist by pouring water in periodically. And having these little furrows down the side makes it much, much easier to add water once you start seeing this drying up. So again, the top can dry up a bit. We want to make sure this area in here stays nice and dry. What will happen is it will uh, promote burrowing and we want the tarantula to feel secure. So a lot of slings will burrow. It'll also allow the tarantula to seek the moisture level it needs. So if the top up here is dry and it's feeling like it's too dry, it'll go ahead and burrow down the corner. Now, there's a couple ways we can add water. For people that like spraying, you can take your spray gun, aim it right toward that corner and spray it. And if you notice, the water is going right on in there and it'll filter down through and keep these lower levels moist while the top will dry up. So it's a good use of spraying because it's not just gonna evaporate very quickly. Another way to do it, and I like these, is the pipettes, pipettes, however it's pronounced. Go ahead, take one of these right down the corner. This way there's no airflow, forced, forced airflow from spraying, which can really irritate tarantulas, are very sensitive to that kind of stuff. Just go ahead, drop it right in there, watch it trickle on down through, add it a couple times. Now one thing you wanna be very, very careful of, A, don't put water down mistakenly, put water down the corner that the tarantula made its burrow in. I've done it before, it's not a good situation, leads to panic. So if you've noticed that the tarantula is burrowed down in here, find where it is, use the water and put it in the other corners. The other thing to be very careful about when adding water to an enclosure is to make sure that the water doesn't filter down through and fill up a burrow. I've had situations where the tarantulas have made a burrow and the path, the path of the water is basically going to be the path of least resistance. So it's going to go ahead and soak down through the sides. But if there's an opening in here, a void, it's going to fill up that void. And you're going to have a really upset tea that has to climb up while that all soaks down in. It's, it becomes a nightmare. So just be careful when adding. To add, be controlled when you add. Add a little bit, watch it filter through, watch the burrow and make sure it's not flooding. Add a little bit more. It doesn't take that long and it allows the tarantula again to pick the level it needs. I always use the story of my Afonopelma Annex. I got it as a sling, little teeny tiny sling, and I put it in one of these enclosures with substrate to give it some spot to dig. And it sat for almost a month and a half right in the corner, all curled up, stressed. It wouldn't eat dead, it wouldn't eat live. So one night, it was winter, I decided that maybe it needed a little more moisture, so I put a furrow in the corner, filled it up with water so it came down and filtered in down here, kept this all nice and moist. The next morning I came down, the tea had gone ahead, burrowed right down the corner I'd moistened, and dug a nice burrow down here. And that was the first time it ate for me, was that day when I dropped a cricket in, came right up, grabbed the cricket, brought it down in its burrow. It needed moisture, it liked the fact that I gave it the opportunity to burrow towards the moisture. So something to keep in mind for your species if they burrow, that will allow them to stay hydrated. They'll be able to regulate themselves. So a great way to do it. And we can add water again, either with the pipettes, the droppers, or we can use a spray bottle. Just aim it at the sides and at the corner. And finally, our last one, 
trusty sprayer, spray bottle, spraying, very popular method. Um, it's fallen out of favor a bit with some people over the years, but I think a lot of people will badmouth it and they use it to some degree. It's not, uh, for a primary way of delivering water to tarantulas, I don't prefer it. I think there are other things that help as well. However, it is good supplementary and it does work in some instances where you can't get in there with a water dish or whatnot. So when I spray, what I wanna do, let's take this arboreal enclosure right here, move these out of the way. What I like to do is aim it at the side of the wall and try to minimize the amount of forced airflow you're getting here because that really upsets the tarantulas. So if I'm spraying, I kind of put it right up here. I sometimes let it actually blow over it so it's aimed in here. Now it's still gonna uh, disturb the tea a bit and that's one of the downfalls of spraying. And keep in mind, this, doesn't work very well. If you see there, we've got some moisture on the side. If the tarantula is out and about, it can go and drink from that. But if I'm spraying during the day, chances are the tarantula is not out and about. And that's going to basically evaporate within a half hour and your tarantula is not going to get a drink. So what we want to do is kind of aim toward the side and really soak it down. And what I want it to do is kind of come down the side here. There we go and moisten the substrate in this area as well. So what will happen is this will obviously evaporate quickly, but this will start soaking on down through, give us a nice little moist spot in the corner. So if you're gonna spray, soak it down a bit, give it, give it a good soak and keep track. I like to kind of tilt my cap up, keep track of where the tarantula is going because chances are it's going to want to bolt once you start spraying. So try to be careful with it. But I found that the majority of them kind of get used to it. They just tuck themselves away and hide. They think it's a rain shower. Now with the boreals, keeping those in mind, another thing you want to do if you're spraying is kind of miss those artificial plants. They will go and drink from the artificial plants. Um, if there's cork marks with little holes in them, what I've done is gone through with the pipette, and filled those up, made little makeshift water dishes. If there is webbing, if you have any tarantula that webs, what you can do is the webbing's waterproof. It forms kind of a natural water dish. So take a little pipette and let's pretend like there's a little hammock of web here and go ahead and fill that right up with some water. Give it a little makeshift water dish. It's about as natural as you can get. But the trick is to not just quick spritz and move on because that doesn't really give the tarantula a great opportunity to drink. And boreals and even terrestrials will come and drink right off the sides of the enclosure. So great way to do it. Another thing to do when spraying is if you've gone ahead and made the furrows that I've recommended in here, when you aim your spray, aim it to the side with the furrow. So what'll happen is it'll puddle up in that furrow in there. It'll go right down in here, soak those bottom layers. Another great way to keep those bottom layers moist and keep your tarantula hydrated. So again, spraying can work. I do use spraying. It, it's great, especially during the hot summer months where things dry up quick to give them a quick drink. But I think you really want to concentrate on soaking. And these are really wet because I've done this a couple times, this video a couple times now and soaked them down. But you want to make sure you aim it toward one side, get part of that substrate wet and allow it to trickle down through, mostly keeping the bottom dry. For a boil, same thing. If we notice right here, and I let this one wait for a bit, if we look right down at the bottom, this has all become wet. That's going to take a while to evaporate. So it's going to raise the humidity in the enclosure a little bit for people that freak out about humidity. But more importantly, it's going to give your arboreal some extra moisture that's not just going to evaporate immediately. So spraying does work. Personally, I like a combination of water dishes first, spraying, and the pipettes going through and making sure my substrate is moist because all tarantulas at the sling stage are very susceptible to dehydration. So you wanna make sure they don't completely dry out. It's probably the, the number one killer of very small slings is dehydration. And this is a good way to keep these nice and wet without disturbing your tea, especially if you're using the pipette, and to make sure that if you're spraying, make sure that spray counts, soak that thing down, make sure it stays there for a while and trickles down through, gives them a little bit moisture, keeps them from drying out. So combination, spraying, dripping, and of course the water dishes right in there is the way to go. Now, what if you're watching this video and you, while you're making your enclosure, you forgot to put little trenches down the side, that's okay. What you can do, and again, you need to be careful, you need to be cognizant of where the tarantula is, is again, we use either our back of our paintbrush, whatever you're using, something very, very small, especially if there's already a tarantula in there. Locate where the T is. So let's pretend like our T is right over here in its burrow. And then very carefully, just make a couple of furrows down the side. You can go down as deep as you feel that you can safely, but be very cognizant of burrows. And I'm going to put one there and one there. And then I'm going to go ahead, take my 
right down the corner, right down the corner. And what that will do, as you can see here, is that's going to allow this to soak on down through, moisten those lower levels. Again, always be cognizant of the burrows. You don't want to flood this and have it come down and fill up the burrow. Your tarantula will not be very happy. You want to make sure that the water soaks down, gets those lower levels, but doesn't fill up in here. And it's as simple as that. Just use a little bit of care. I, I've noticed a lot of times when I make my enclosures up, if I don't do the furrows and I go ahead and spray it or wet it down, the water tends to puddle up top. Making these furrows will give it a little place to go so you can fill in little pockets there with some water, let it go, and it'll give your tarantula a spot that's nice and moist and keep uh, to keep it hydrated. So little tip there. All right, so now it's time to perform maintenance on our sling. Um, unfortunately, I have a juvenile here. My slings um, aren't cooperating at the moment, so just bear with me on this one. But tarantulas are very, very neat animals overall, so husbandry really isn't that difficult for them. Um, neither is the maintenance. It's not like a gerbil or a rabbit or some other type of mammal that you have to clean constantly. They're very, very neat animals. So there's a couple things you want to look out for as this albopolosum tries to escape on me. First off, you want to take out um, any molts when they happen. Now, people tend to freak out about molts, and I get a lot of emails like, I can't get to the molt, it's in the burrow. Don't worry about a molt if you can't get to it. It's not going to hurt anything. I just rehoused a bunch of m 40s in a communal where there were dozens of molts in there. They don't mold. They don't attract pests. I've had no zero issues with molts being left in the enclosures. And sometimes it's easier to just leave them in there. Some burrowing species will actually incorporate old molts into their burrows. Um, other uh, species are nice enough to take the molts out and toss them into water dishes. Some will just leave them where they are and you won't be able to get to them conveniently. It's best not to disturb the tarantula. So when in doubt, if you can't get to it easily, leave it alone. Don't try to grab it from one that just freshly molted. You could injure the tea. Once the tarantula has hardened up and is okay, go in, grab the molt if it's available. So I picked this one here because it molted and I hadn't taken the molt out. So basically what we're going to do is look inside at a couple things here. Hope she doesn't escape. Click on the light. All right, here we go. So right there we have our molt. Use tongs, don't use your fingers, and just take the molt out. Simple as that. That's it. There's most of your husbandry right there. Second thing you want to do is see if there are any boluses. Now I have one right over here where I gave it a large cricket. Um, for slings, you won't be able to see the boluses most of the time. So don't go nuts if you don't find one. Uh, they're very, very teeny tiny. I feed mine sometimes uh, red runners and they leave very little material behind after they're finished with them. This is the remains of their food uh, sources, their uh, food prey insects. So after they crunch it all up, eat it, this is what's left over. If you can find it, great. If you can't, don't worry about it. I have found that many species of tarantulas or many tarantulas will drop their boluses in the same spot. So what will end up happening sometimes is you don't find the first or the second, but you'll start seeing them pile up. So we'll just go ahead in with a pair of tweezers. Take that out. Done. Now, I always do this twice a week, and it should be on the same feeding schedule you feed your slings at. If it's extra hot out, you probably want to do it a little bit more. But you want to go ahead and fill that water dish up. Don't worry about it if a little bit gets spilled around the side, as we see here. Um, the area around it got a little bit wet, not a problem. You can let that get a little wet. If when you fill your water dish, you spill it over and moisten up the substrate around it, the next time you fill it, move the water dish so you don't always have it in the same spot because that can sometimes lead to mold. And then um, regarding mold, don't totally freak out if you see a little spot of mold. Sometimes what happens is when we don't get those boluses, we don't see them, they get wet and a little mold forms. Take a little spoon. I have a bunch of plastic spoons that I keep just for this purpose. Go in there and just scoop out the offending item, the bolus or whatever it may be that was molding, and some of the substrate around it, and then let that corner dry out. It should be fine after that. So don't freak out if you see a little bit of mold in there. If you're getting a lot of mold and you have a very, very moist enclosure, that means you need to improve the airflow and dry things out a little bit because although you want to keep your slings on slightly moist substrate and again we did the whole thing on keeping the bottom layers moist and the top dry 
you don't want a situation where it becomes a petri dish for mold and other things so there we go that's pretty much it for maintenance go in refill the water bowl reposition the water bowl if needed try to find the boluses if you can't don't worry about it and if there's a mold to pull out go ahead and pull it out if you can't get to it just leave it alone don't make a big deal out of it don't disturb the tea any more than you have to and that's pretty much all there is to tarantula maintenance uh, besides this, the only thing that you may have, that you will have to do eventually is a rehousing. And I've got plenty of videos up to show how that should happen. But for the most part, that is it. And if you're going to be getting into the hobby, go ahead and get yourself some tongs. Different sizes will work. Um, this is one of those things where you want to keep your fingers away from the tarantulas. Start with good habits now, although some of these obviously can't hurt you too much with the bite and some of the New World species are actually fairly docile. If you're planning on at some point graduating into Old Worlds, develop those good habits now of not sticking your fingers in there and grabbing a water dish or plucking out a bolus because later on when you have an Old World species, you're going to be more inclined to do that. So I try to encourage people, again, I get it, some of these guys are so cute and wouldn't hurt a fly, well, maybe a fly, but start with your using good habits early, get those tongs, use the tongs, and keep your fingers away from those tarantulas. So I covered the whole tarantula temperature and humidity thing in an article a while back and I'll go ahead and put a link here. So I'm not going to rehash the whole thing. However, it's very important to note that these are very resilient creatures and unfortunately care sheets online have conditioned us to believe that the majority of them need very specific humidity and temperature requirements and that's not true. They're just not as fragile as we sometimes make them out to be. So in a moment I'm going to cover temperatures in a little more detail but to start with humidity, the fact that we started with moist substrate, we're keeping water dishes in the enclosure, we're spraying occasionally and or keeping the substrate moist is all we need. You do not need to worry about buying humidity gauges. Most of these ones from Petco and um, Zoomed don't work anyway to keep track of the humidity in the enclosure. So we're throwing humidity right out the window. If you notice the air in your home is getting particularly dry and you're having a hard time keeping the substrate moist, the water dishes full, I will get to that in a moment after this uh, little episode on temperatures. But don't obsess over these. Generally speaking, if you're comfortable in your home, your tarantula is going to be comfortable as well and your sling is going to do fine. So let's talk about temperatures first. Okay, we're in my tarantula room right now and I just wanted to spend a moment talking about temperature. As you can see here as we zoom in, I have one thermometer that I basically use to gauge the temperature in the entire room. When raising slings, you don't want to fixate on the individual temperatures inside the enclosures, nor do you want to become obsessed with some false ideal temperatures that you read on a care sheet online. Bottom line is this, if you're comfortable, your tarantulas are fine. Now to explain, we're talking high 60s, that's okay for the majority of species out there. I, my first year raising slings, my temperatures dipped down into the 60s, usually 67 would be the lowest for a little bit. They didn't stay there, and that's important to note that in some species, you know, like Avicularia, a little more finicky when it comes to temperature, but even they will do fine in a dip into the 60s. So if your house isn't quite at that level, don't freak out, because the one thing we seem to forget is although these guys obviously are much more active and they eat more, during the warmer months, many of the species, especially the ones like Afonapelma, Brachypelma, um, Gramostola, come from areas where they get temperatures down into the 50s and even some places the 40s. So it's not going to kill them if the temperature drops at all, nor is it really going to hurt them. What you will get is probably some fasting. Once they, they are triggered into thinking that it's colder winter months, some of them will stop eating. And then what you also get is a little bit slower growth rate, which really isn't a big deal. It's not hurting the tea. The tea isn't starving. It's just got a more natural metabolism compared to what it would have when it was in the wild. So with temperatures, I get a lot of people email about uh, freaking out because their temperature is 70 and they're afraid it's going to hurt their brachypelma hammeri or smithy sling, or just not to confuse, use both names. No, it's going to be completely fine. And some of them will continue to eat just fine and molt just fine 
through those lower temperatures. So what I will do is put it kind of over here what I think are the okay temperatures. Anything 68 or above is going to be fine. Even 67, 66 for a little while isn't going to be bad in most cases. I just spoke to a keeper that's been keeping for three years. He's in Scotland and his temperatures during the winter often dip to 66 or so and his tarantulas have all been doing five. Actually, I think it was even lower than that. Um, so don't fret over the temperatures as much. Ideally, when using temperatures, notice I have one thermometer, you know, kind of gauge what it is in that room, but don't freak out if it drops a little bit. And one of the things you can also do is look to get a space heater if your house is super cold or if you can't heat the entire room. Find another room to put them in that's a little bit warmer and sometimes putting them up higher. Right now, the temperature in this room is 79. If I put this thermostat lower, it'll be most likely be about 76. So positioning your teas in a room that has a nice warm corner and away from a place that has drafts. You don't want, you know, in your living room where the door opens and there's 30 degree winds blasting in. Find a spot where it's nice and warm um, and don't obsess over temperature. It's uh, something I think gives people still fits and part of it's due to the online information you get with the care sheets that tell you if they drop below this amount, they're going to die. Just if, if you don't believe what I'm saying, take a species, research the climate from where it comes from, and I'm sure you're going to find that they tolerate much worse than what they're going to get in our homes. Okay, if you live in a place like I do where you have long, cold winters, you're going to have a furnace running and unfortunately the furnace can really dry out the air. Now, even if you're diligent with keeping your slings hydrated with water dishes, spraying, and making sure the substrate's moist, those little cages can dry up very, very quickly. So one of the things you can do to prevent this is create kind of a sling nursery. So what I have here is a larger plastic container. You can use just about anything. Um, ideally, you want it ventilated on the sides. Let me kick the light on here so we can see it. Not on the top because that allows for evaporation much more quickly. And then what we're going to do is couple ways you can go out this one line the bottom with paper towels um, you can do this this is what a lot of people do when they keep slings like uh, that have just hatched out of an egg sack you put a paper towels in and it keeps the humidity up and then what you can do is go ahead and just soak down the paper towels you could also use vermiculite and moisten that down that will also hold water really well and allow it to evaporate another thing you can do is and this is very easy is put in a smaller container Fill it up with water. And as that water slowly evaporates from the container, it'll keep the humidity up inside the enclosure. And again, I'm not talking about obsessing over humidity, but it is important to recognize that the humidity inside your home when the heat is running gets very, very low. We've measured it in my house and it's been in the teens and even to the single digits. I mean, very, very dry. Everybody's skin's dry, we're scratching, we have to run humidifiers. So if you can't run a humidifier, this is an easy way to do it. And then what you just do is put your slings around that container. And you can obviously hold quite a few and if you have more slings, you can get a bigger container. And just put the cap on. Done. And this way, as the water slowly evaporates, it'll raise the humidity just inside of here, which will protect the slings. You won't have to be as diligent in keeping them hydrated. It makes it a lot easier. I've used this pretty much every winter since I've had slings, and it's made things a lot easier because I've literally sprayed down, soaked substrate, kept water dishes, and in three days on a really cold day when the, the furnace is running, it can dry out very, very quickly. So that's it, that's all there is to it. Now, for people that can't heat, uh, can't keep the temperature in their house to a point where the slings can be comfortable, and we're talking, you know, high 60s or above, if you have a home that's very, very cold and drafty and there isn't a warm corner, the other trick to heating them, and I haven't done it personally myself, but I have uh, friends that have done this method, is you can get a larger container like this, usually an aquarium works well, and then put a heat mat on the side with something to regulate the temperature. You don't want it to get too hot. Just raise the temperature inside of this a couple degrees and keep your sling safe. So that's an easy way to do it. But I encourage people to try to find a warm corner of the house or even use a space heater or something to heat the whole room. A very, very simple thing to do, not too expensive, and it'll keep your sling safe when the air dries out. And now that you got your sling, usually the next question after it's been eaten for a while is how do I tell it's in pre-molt? There are a few telltale signs. First and foremost, the sling will usually stop eating. That's time for them to prepare for the molt. 
their abdomens will become very fat and shiny and we're going to go over that in a moment and show what that looks like and then the entire abdomen for some of the older slings may completely darken up and keyword is completely and we're going to go over that in a moment as well and then another big sign is obviously the tarantula becomes very slow and lethargic some of the quick ones may just sit still for a while and they will bury themselves or web themselves up in their burrows because that's their way of putting up the do not disturb sign. So here I got a couple examples. This one here is my Brachypelma baby, and you can see this is not a tarantula. It's in pre-molt. It's only eaten once after molt. And you can see the abdomen skin is not particularly shiny. It's kind of pale. And we're going to talk about that dark patch of hair on the back because I think a lot of people mistake that for the abdomen darking up when in fact it's just hair. And here we have my Clazi, who you can see has very, very shiny, distended, enlarged abdomen. You can see the shine off of it. That's the difference between the two. That is a fat, shiny, plump abdomen. This one's in pre-molt. It's also, if you notice, in its burrow, which is another sign. And unfortunately, the light's startling her. And there you can see that dark patch of hair. Again, that is not a pre-molt sign. So as she goes around, you can definitely see the light, you know, reflecting off of her abdomen there, nice and shiny. Um, back to this one here, you can see the abdomen is a little bit smaller when compared to the carapace, although we're looking at the underneath, and the skin there isn't nearly as shiny or stretched out. And that's what you want to look for. It almost looks like if you've ever had a tick on a dog that has uh, been feeding for a while, that very distended, shiny, uh, bloated look. And here we got an older sling. This is one of my Formictopus species, and you can see here that patch of hair as I focus, there we go, and you can also see the abdomen overall is a darker purplish color. For larger slings, you will see the hair underneath that's on their new exoskeleton start to show through, so you'll get an overall purplish, color, purplish coloration. That black spot, again, is just the hairs on the spider there. And here we have my G. rosea. Um, when she was in pre -molt, I got this picture of her. You can see here that her abdomen is quite large and very dark. She's a little bit older here, so her darker abdomen here is showing through underneath there. That spot in the back is a mirror patch of hair, that little shimmering spot. But you can see she's quite um, enlarged, especially when you compare her abdomen to her carapace right here. Much, much bigger than her carapace. This is a fat sling that is uh, definitely ready to molt. And she did molt like a month after this. She took a little while. And then what other people mistake is sometimes they look at their slings and they see this shape running down the back of their abdomen. It's like a darker purplish area with little branching things. That is not a sign of pre-molt. Um, this is very noticeable on larger specimens when they kick their hairs off, that is actually the tarantula's heart. That's normal. So that is a heart. That is not a sign of pre-molt. So when you see those, that like ridge going down the back, the darkened ridge, don't be confused, not necessarily a sign of pre-molt. And then of course, one of the biggest signs of slings entering this period is burrowing. And here we've got one of my specimens, Campus Stratus, I believe, yep. And right now you can just see her wiggling around trying to get away from the light. She is completely, or he, is completely buried in the burrow. And this is natural behavior. This freaks a lot of people out. They worry that their tarantula is burrowed. They need to dig it up. It's going to die. 99% of the time there's nothing, 99.9% .9 of the time there's nothing wrong with that. It's normal behavior. It's, again, their way of putting up the do not disturb sign. This is a dangerous period for them because they're not eating. Uh, they're sometimes not able to protect, uh, protect themselves when they're about to molt. So they hide themselves. They basically bury holes. This would behoove them in the wild so they keep them away from predators during this period. But you can see she's got a burrow all the way underneath there. There are no tunnels going into it. If... Uh, you look from the top, you won't see any holes going down. So it does look like the tarantula is completely burrowed, but she's safe, secure. And this one did just eat a couple huge meals before retreating back down and burying herself again. So she's waiting to molt. And here we have a picture of my GBB, or Green Bottle Blue, or C. Cayenne pubescens uh, flipped over. When tarantulas molt, they do go on their back, so if you notice your sling on your back, you don't want to touch it or fiddle with it or do anything blow on it. Just leave it alone. It's in the molting process. And this is an example of a tarantula that doesn't bury itself. A lot of the arboreals will just web a lot and web themselves up in a corner to do molting. So another example of what it would look like when your teeth starts doing this behavior, either burying itself or 
burrowing and covering itself up or webbing up a corner and hiding in a little cocoon of webbing. That's totally normal behavior and again, a, a very obvious sign of premolt activity. Another common question is how often do they molt? And unfortunately, this one's a tough one to pin down because it depends on the species. For example, my GBB, when it was about a three quarter inch sling, molted every six weeks or so like clockwork. My G. rosea, when I got it, molted every four to six months. So there can be a big difference depending on the species. Also, feeding schedule and the temperatures can determine how fast they'll molt. So somebody keeping their tarantulas at 80 degrees and feeding them three times a week may have faster growth than somebody keeping them in the 70s and feeding them twice a week. So that's something to consider. Also, the size of the specimen is very important to consider. Smaller slings tend to general, uh, for many species, the smaller slings tend to molt more often. Um, as they get older, they tend to molt less often. So a smaller sling may, you know, half inch sling may start molting every two months or so. Once it hits, you know, inch and a half, you may see that slow way down. So something to consider. Um, for many slings, six weeks to a month is about what it takes if they're fed on a decent schedule. But again, it all varies. And pre-molt can last a couple weeks to a month or more. So don't freak out if your tarantula stops eating for a little while and you're worried that it's uh, going to starve to death. It's not going to starve to death. Sometimes that pre-molt period takes quite a long time. Um, I've had some like uh, my G. pulchropes who literally took months in between molts. So not something to panic about as long as they're in good shape, well fed, and they have water available. And finally, a common question is, when can I expect my little sling that looks like this to start looking like this? Or when is my sling going to start looking like a tarantula? And again, it all depends on the species. Here I have a Formictopus species. They can go from a little sling to a three and a half inch hairy looking like an adult spider in about a year's time. Where other species, specifically Afonapelma, Gramostola, and Brachypelma species can take a couple years to get to that point. Um, I always point to my G. pulchropes. I've raised several of them now and my two smallest ones that I got at about 0.3 inch slings took almost four years to start to look like adults and get some size on them. So it all depends on the species, how often it's fed, a lot of factors, but know that the time you have, you have your sling and keep it is very, very rewarding. And most people find that although you're excited to watch them grow up and see them become big, you know, robust adults, the time watching them grow up and spent watching them grow up is very, very rewarding. Okay, and there you have it. That's the end of part two. So, yep, this was a marathon viewing, but I'm hoping that I covered everything. If not, or if you need clarification, please comment. I'll be more than happy to answer any questions. And if there are enough questions, we can always put together a third quick uh, revisit video in which I answer those questions. I try to get everything, but I'm sure something else will come up. And once again, if you want to read the original text for this article, you can go online to tomsbigspiders.com and read the article itself. So thanks to anybody who took the time to watch this entire thing. I don't expect many will. And for those of you who keep tarantulas and follow my channel and are sitting there like, I know all this already, my apologies for the two very lengthy videos. But my hopes are that people just getting into the hobby might find this, or ones just getting into slings might find this useful. So thanks again.